Thing. Order! Order! And you are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Two northern cities, two speeches from two men, one who's currently Chancellor and another who thinks he will be in five weeks' time. One clear headline, though, emerged this morning. Both the Conservatives and Labour are promising to crack out the credit cards to boost investment in public infrastructure. In Liverpool, Labour's John McDonnell pledged investment on a scale never seen before. And in Manchester, Chancellor Sajid Javid ripped up his party's fiscal rules to promise he too would borrow to fund new schemes. The bidding war means that whatever happens at the end of this election campaign, it is very likely that the UK's national debt pile will rise. We'll be making sense tonight of the promises and asking a Labour frontbencher what his party has planned, as well as assessing the rest of the day's action from the campaign trail. But first, our economics editor, Ben Chu, has been crunching the numbers. He's here, as well as our political editor, Nick Watt. Uh, good evening to both of you. Ben, what's been announced today, then? So, Emma, as you said, whatever happens after this general election, we seem to be set for a step up in public spending, particular capital spending. So this is spending on things like infrastructure, roads and rail, not the day-to-day -day public spending on wages and things like that in the public sector. What Sajid Javid announced is that his new fiscal rule will allow him to spend 3% of GDP a year on this type of spending. So the green bars is what they're currently planned to spend on it. You can see the blue bars on top of that, an extra £20 billion on top of that uh, under the Conservatives' new fiscal rules. Uh, and here's what uh, Sajid Javid said about that spending today. Hospitals, schools, railways, better broadband, new connections and opportunities for every part of our great nation. So meanwhile, Labour are effectively planning to spend £100 billion a year uh, on top of the, uh, in, in total on this type of spending. You can see from the red bars here, considerably more than the Conservatives, actually a doubling on current levels. And here's what the uh, Shadow Chancellor, John McDonnell, said about that spending pledge. That means change, real change. And it means investment on a scale never seen before in this country, and certainly never seen before in the north and outside of London and the southeast. So the Conservatives aren't planning to spend as much as Labour, but it is a significant shift in their rhetoric and their plans is what they've announced today. The talk about government spending as a share of GDP falling every year has now gone. And perhaps that represents a shift and recognition that despite the rhetoric of ministers, that perhaps the economy has not been working as well for ordinary people as it might have done. Um, it's sometimes easy to lose uh, sight of how these sort of decisions on public finances and fiscal rules impact on ordinary people's lives. But here's a striking statistic, Emma. Um, if we look at the 10-year uh, wage growth uh, over the past 300 years, actually we're on course for the worst decade of, pub of wage growth for ordinary people since the Napoleon Napoleonic Wars two centuries ago. And Good trivia. <laughs> absolutely. The plight of low-income workers certainly emphasised by John McDonnell yes. in his speech today, talking about uh, the, uh, what he saw as the scandal of the existence of food banks and zero-hour contracts. Thank you for bringing us up to date on the figures. Nick Watt, then, our political editor. Uh, some late-breaking news as we were coming on air this evening with regards to the Conservatives. That's right. The Conservative Party have announced that their candidate in the very safe Norfolk seat of Broadland will be standing down uh, as a candidate in the general election. This is Nick Conrad, and it was some remarks he made in 2014 about rape. It was a discussion on BBC Radio Norfolk where he was a presenter until earlier this week. And let's look at what he said. He said, women have to understand that when a man's given certain signals, he'll wish to act upon them. And if you don't wish to give out the wrong signals, it's best probably to keep your knickers on and not get into bed with him. Now, Angela Rayner, who's the Shadow Education Secretary, described those remarks as despicable, and she called on Boris Johnson to remove Nick Conrad as the candidate. So this evening, Nick Conrad has issued a statement. He described his marks as ill-judged. He said he made a genuine and heartfelt apology, but then he says, I've reluctantly concluded I must stand down to allow, to allow one of the other excellent candidates the opportunity to win this fantastic seat. On the Labour side of this, though, 
uh, not the only candidate to, to stand down today. That's right. Labour has lost two candidates today. So they firstly lost Francis Hall in Edinburgh South West. Um, Francis Hall issued an offensive tweet about her SNP opponent, Joanna Cherry. And also Labour has lost its candidate in the North East Scotland seat of Gordon. That's Kate Ramsden. The Jewish Chronicle highlighted a blog in which she compared Israel to an abused child that becomes an abusive adult. So a troubled start to this campaign for the two main parties. Nick, thank you. Well, it's likely that both party HQs will be hoping the rows about some of their candidates will be overshadowed by their messages on the economy. This election is likely to see a scramble for those votes of those on low incomes, especially in the north of England and the Midlands, where party loyalties often run deep. But in an election that's been brought about by Brexit, will voters' views on that mean more than their other concerns? Ben has been speaking to some voters to find out. The seasons have changed, but something else might be shifting too. Long-held political allegiances seem to be up for grabs. And Labour is counting on voters, particularly those on low incomes, to look beyond the vexed issue of Brexit. All the parties seem to be really realising they have got to make a pitch to low income voters, but also that that pitch has got to go beyond Brexit. That although that is of course important, actually it's economic concerns that are the top priority for most low income voters. Polling by the Joseph Rowntree Foundation suggests low income voters care somewhat less about Brexit than the rest of the population and that they're voting in higher numbers than before. There are more than 100 marginal constituencies where the number of low-income swing voters is greater than the local MP's majority. So understanding and catering to the concerns of this group will be central to the party's campaigns. So what does this group of voters really care about? Brexit, living standards or something else? Keithley in West Yorkshire won last time by Labour by just 239 votes, is one such marginal seat in play. Catherine Geddes is training for a qualification in adult social care. I'm working class and there's a, a lot of issues for me, you know, like being on low income, I have no savings, you know, it's, it's a very scary time for people, I think. Yeah, yeah, and scarier than it has been in the past. Oh, though, 100%, that's... yeah. And I just want to make the point that, you know, you're four paychecks away from being homeless. For Labour, public services and the cost of living are territory they are comfortable fighting on. Catherine is a passionate Remainer, but Brexit isn't the primary issue for her. The main thing for me would be the absolute crisis that is housing. Uh, there needs to be more social housing built, um, which hasn't been done so far. I work with uh, kids that are in hostels, temporary accommodation, and the struggle to try and find them housing is just beyond imaginable. 80 miles north is Bishop Auckland, another constituency where Labour has a slim majority over the Tories. Steve Watson works at South Durham Structures, a steel fabrication company, as does Rob Trey. The local unemployment rate is 50% higher than the national average. I've always voted Labour, voted Labour all my life. But I'll tell you the truth, I'll never vote again for it. So why is that? I voted for Brexit, but Labour's always blocked it every time. Is Brexit more important than the NHS? Uh, more important than education? More important than housing, all those other issues? Well, if we come out, we'll take it as it comes after that. We'll, we'll, we'll sort things out. I mean, if we come out three years ago when we said we were going to, we might have been on a, on a steadfast way, now we might, we might be all right. But it, it's like everything else, it's a learning curve again. We start from the beginning. For both of them, Labour's position on Brexit is an electoral deal-breaker. It's the first time I've ever considered in my life voting Conservative, staunch Labour. But it's the lesser of two evils for definite at the moment. There's some Labour policies that are deep at heart, I would always go for. And what are they, just out of interest? The NHS, uh, partly the unions, um, and just social care in general. But if your party's going against what people want, they shouldn't be in 
politics. Why ask for a vote if you're just going to say, nah, no, no, we're not going to accept that. In these turbulent times, is it correct to think low-income voters are prepared to move on from Brexit? The course of the election might just depend on the answer. We asked for an interview with anyone from the Conservative Party, but we were told nobody was available. I'm joined now from Salford by Jonathan Reynolds, Shadow Economic Secretary to the Treasury. Good evening. Good evening. What makes Labour think that doubling government infrastructure spending next year from £50 billion to £100 billion, what makes Labour think that you can increase spending so dramatically without wasting a huge amount of money? No government has ever suggested such a huge spike. Well, there's two things that we're trying to do. First of all, we're trying to see the investment in infrastructure that we think the country needs, especially in the north of England. And you've seen the, the northern regional papers today with a unanimous plea for a, a real set of investment proposals for the north. And as well as that, we're trying to meet the climate emergency. And we think both of those things are, are, are huge problems. If you look at the, the productivity problem in the UK, that's very significant. And of course, the climate emergency is an unprecedented uh, situation that needs an unprecedented level of response. And we think if you take those challenges and you look at comparable levels of public investment in other developed countries, what we're proposing today is possible and it's required and we think the response from the public to it will be there. But we can't even see our governments deliver on infrastructure that's already underway, big infrastructure projects like HS2. You're proposing doubling the amount that is spent and economists have already said there's concern that there will then be waste. Why, when we've seen what's happened so far with HS2, which isn't going to be on time and is over budget, should we trust in a government to double the amount of spend without waste? Well, it's true to say there are examples you could give of big infrastructure projects that have been difficult. I, I would say just on HS2, we've changed, or the country has changed in many ways the plans for that. We've got more tunnelling and that sort of thing, so the cost of that will go up. But if that's what we want to do, we have to understand that's how those projects will progress. Or on some things we want to do, if you look at the challenge of retrofitting buildings, getting our energy, our housing stock more energy efficient, that could be started immediately. Bigger schemes, more uh, rail capacity in the north of England, that would clearly take time. But a lot of those plans are being developed now. The plan for what's called Northern Powerhouse Rail, a new uh, rail infrastructure between Liverpool and Hull, that is being developed now. Those so these plans are, are not, in place. That, sorry to interrupt you there, but those things are not going to add up to a hundred billion. I mean, we're talking about major projects here. Just on the point of HS2, does Labour support it continuing? Uh, yes, we do, um, and we're very much in favour of new public uh, transport infrastructure and, and HS2 and is a key part of our rail plans going forward. And do you support Heathrow expansion? Well, we'll have to, to wait for the manifesto on, on Heathrow expansion. Sorry, but... have you not been told? You're a member of the Shadow Cabinet. We're now in the first full week of the general election. Surely you know if you support it or not, because we're talking about major infrastructure here. Well, I'm not in the Shadow Cabinet. I'm a junior Treasury Minister, so um, we'll find out what is precisely in the manifesto on Heathrow when that time comes you... out. But we're talking about Sorry, you infrastructure don't know if you today. Sorry, you've just said you're going to increase by £50 billion what we're going to spend on infrastructure. And you don't know if you support the expansion of Heathrow into this election now, with only 35 days to go till we go to the polls. No, I'm saying there'll be an announcement on all of those big infrastructure projects that are already on the books in the manifesto, and you'll just have to wait for that. But what we're talking about today is the need to increase investment overall, especially in the north, and not just to increase the amount of resource going in, but to change who makes the decisions about what projects yes. should proceed with well, more say for the north and actually a better way to account for the national accounts where we look at our assets as well as our liabilities. And, and that is what we need to do to meet the climate emergency. I wanted to talk to you about the shift of power because that was mm. something you also spoke about today. John McDonnell said a Treasury unit will be set up in the north of England. Uh, will there be the permanent secretary there? Uh, well, that kind of level of detail doesn't mean, need to be decided now. The main thing is we're talking about transferring big parts of Whitehall, how it operates, where the people who are making and profiling not, these decisions sorry, I, would be based. I'm asked about the most senior position, bar the Chancellor, in, in the civil service to do with the Treasury. It's not a small detail. You talked about, or rather John McDonnell, the Labour Party, talked today about shifting the centre of gravity away from London. Why can't you commit to putting the permanent secretary there? 
Well, I don't think that's the level of detail we need to be talking about in the campaign. I'm here in part of the, the BBC here in Salford, and we didn't need to move the Director General to do that. So, look, there are no, good I'm examples of how that infrastructure Sorry. can change. Sorry, so I'm, I, not saying, I'm not saying move the Chancellor. OK, I, I, if you don't want that level of detail, let's zoom out, let's go bigger. Uh, John McDonnell has toyed before with moving the Bank of England north moving it out of London. Why no mention of that today? If you're going to shift, I'm using your words, shift the centre of gravity of power. Because if you're just tinkering around the edges with moving a few more civil servants into the northwest, where's the power shift? Well, it's not tinkering. We said very clearly what we call the National Transformation Fund, which is this big capital public investment, capital spending fund. That unit would be based outside of London in the north of England so that the civil servants who are working on the plans for these big infrastructure projects would be based outside of the south east. And we think that is possible. We think that is a reasonable suggestion. We think that's a popular suggestion. And we think that was what will make the difference. And there the is a bias England? in this country. How With the Bank, the Bank of, England, of England, we've already said parts of the Bank of England would move likely to Birmingham. Again, a reasonable spatial strategy that most big European countries have. You don't need all of your big institutions concentrated in your capital city. Um, there are good precedents for that, good examples of that. So yes, that's what we intend to do. It's not just about tinkering with things, it's about moving real decision makers out of the southeast so all parts so of the country are going to say. Decision makers will be moved, that's what you're saying today. Because of course, if you look at the Civil Servants and Institute of Government report, only mm. a minority of civil servants are actually based in London. 83,500 out of the 430,000, more than 50,000 are already based in the northwest. But you're saying decision makers will be moved. Um, if I could come to the news as we came on air this evening, we were talking about in the Conservative side of things, a candidate uh, having to step down. This has happened with two Labour candidates today. But specifically, John McDonnell, when giving an interview today, and he said these remarks are actually at the weekend as well. Uh, with regards to anti-Semitism that was t linked to one of those candidates having to stand down. Uh, he said, everything that has been asked of us by the Jewish community, we have done. And yet today, there's a historic front page of the Jewish Chronicle newspaper where it says nearly half of the Jewish community is seriously considering emigrating if Jeremy Corbyn gets into office. How on earth can John McDonnell say that everything that the Jewish community wanted to be done has been done, if that is the Jewish community telling its newspaper how it feels. Well, of course, I'm very sad to see headlines like that. I've been critical of my own party in the past on how this has been handled, but I do think there have been improvements. There are people who I didn't John want McDonald's says in the Labour been Party. Done. Well, I think there are people who were in the Labour Party who now aren't, who have been uh, excluded, expelled from it, and I think that is something I wanted to see. So when there has been progress, if I've been critical in Jonathan, the past, I'll Jonathan, acknowledge that now, and that Jonathan is the right Reynolds. thing to have done. Jonathan Reynolds, rather than going over what you've said before, I'm talking to you about today in the general election campaign. We have heard today that someone has had to step down, someone who was vetted because they compared, you used an old anti-Semitic trope, comparing mm. Israel to an abused child that became the abuser, invoking the memory of the Holocaust. Why had that person been allowed to become a candidate? And why is it accurate for John McDonnell to say that everything the Jewish community wanted to be done has been done. Well, that person has been removed as a candidate. That's exactly the kind of due How diligence they a candidate? that should go on. Well, you know, look, they've been removed as a candidate. That's got to be the right thing to have happened. If, it, if someone like that hadn't been removed as a candidate, I would rightly be critical of that. Let, but where let, the right let, thing let has been done, I, I think that's I something think you, we should actually, recognise. I don't think you're understanding my question. Is it not premature of the Shadow Chancellor to say that everything that needed to have been done has been done on the same day, literally two hours later, when a candidate had to be removed. Could you accept that? It seems premature. Well, look, I can see the point that you are making. I'm simply saying if I've been critical in the past of how some things have been dealt with and now people who should be removed are being removed, then I recognise that is the right thing that has happened and I'm pleased that that has happened. But if there's more uh, to be done, then that should continue. But uh, what would worry me is if that due diligence wasn't going on and these people weren't being removed. So are more people going to be removed? I don't know. I mean, I, so the job, I, is, I, the job of cleaning up Labour from anti-Semitism isn't finished, despite what the Shadow Chancellor has said. 
we can never be complacent about uh, any sort of uh, racism or discrimination in society and we should never be complacent about our own organisations. The fact is there have been people who needed to be uh, removed from the Labour Party and that has happened and I'm pleased about that. So but do you, we do cannot you, say you, that in all circumstances for a party our size there will not be people you, where we find that we're not happy with what they've said or done in the past and we have to take action about them. There is a rigorous disciplinary process within Labour and if that's working and people who shouldn't be Labour candidates are being removed or shouldn't be in the Labour Party at all, then I think we've got to recognise that's a good thing. Jonathan Reynolds, thank you very much thank for your you. time this evening.